Welcome to Two Sets FC. I'm your host, Amobi Kugo, back again with my guy, L. Each week, we'll be discussing topics from around the soccer world and giving you our unfiltered thoughts and opinions. This week, we're joined by wellness coach and leader of community programs for Sporting KC, my sister, my Igbo <laughs> sister, Chioma Atamo. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we'll be getting to know Chioma, uh, talking about the state of U.S. soccer, and then saluting one of the all-time greats, Eddie Pope, for Black Soccer History. Uh, Chioma, how are you doing today? I am doing well. I am blessed. The sun is out. I don't know if you heard about how cold it was in Kansas City. I know like a large part of the country was hit cold. So I'm just excited the sun is out. How are you guys doing? Yeah, we're doing well. well. Yeah, glad to have you on. You know, you know, you're a busy lady. You have flights, you have meetings, you have to do it all. So uh, thank you so much for making the time. Of course. First question we ask everybody that's on the show. When did you fall in love with soccer? Who I fell in love with soccer in second grade. I was playing outside just recess with the boys. I felt like it was, I was really the only girl playing. And there is this boy who was always making fun of me. And I was just like, I'm just going to slide tackle the mess out of him. <laughs> and I did. And then just gained his respect and then everybody else's respect. And I was like, okay, soccer can can do some stuff for me. So yeah, that's when that's when I fell in love with the sport. So <laughs> no, I love that. So talk about, I mean, you know, where you grew up, where you're from. How did you get to where you are now? You know, obviously with your role with Kansas City um, yeah. and you know, the things that you do outside of uh, Kansas City. Yeah, so uh, born and raised in the Bay Area, California, uh, moved to Arizona in 2006, for my junior year of high school, which is really tough, moving to Arizona from the Bay Area. Okay. Um, but as an athlete, I feel like that's the easiest way for people to make friends is playing sports. So I ran track, played volleyball, uh, played soccer, and went to school in Tucson, Arizona, at the University of Arizona. And I chose that school because it was far enough where my parents couldn't like roll up on me at ASU, <laughs> but it was, but you know, it's, it's far enough where they wouldn't have to give me a warning of some sort. Cause my parents are pastors and lived a, lived a very sheltered life. And I wanted to use college as a way to just explore life a little bit. So um, in school, I changed my major a couple times, uh, found out about FC Tucson, the PDL club, and just volunteered my time there. Um, I couldn't play soccer anymore due to injuries, and I just wanted a way to stay connected to the game. So I just became obsessed with the energy there. I just loved how it was high energy. It was soccer. Um, we would operate as an events company in the beginning of the year and host MLS preseason. So now we were getting all of these clubs from MLS. We had national teams. We had a team from Korea, Netherlands, Chivas Guadalajara, like all these clubs. I'm like, they're coming to Arizona. It's so cool to just, hmm. it was like networking one-on-one, but everybody was coming here. So um, continuing to work my way up the system there, uh, held positions from administration to fitness coach, nutritionist, became the director of operations, uh, then Phoenix Rising, uh, bought out FC Tucson and I became like, I started working with Phoenix Rising, uh, did MLS preseason again, and then I hit a ceiling. I was just like, okay, I want to work for MLS. And I didn't think that, I wasn't sure where Phoenix Rising and um, FC Tucson would, would fall in the next couple of years, but I knew mm -hmm. I just wanted to work for an MLS club. And so Sporting was one of the first clubs that stuck out as like one of the most professional. We would have close to 14 MLS clubs and I just really enjoyed working with their staff and um, there was an opportunity to come into Kansas City, went out there and then, um, yeah, did that. And then on the other hand, with being a wellness coach, um, working as a fitness coach and nutritionist with uh, FC Tucson, I noticed a lot of the players mentally were just struggling with not, you know, getting that call up to make that professional team or they were struggling to figure out how to eat to make sure that they were ex like extending their career and I feel like food and your mental health is the one thing that could really help um, just set you apart. So I created Mindful Appetite as a way to um, educate athletes on a way to prioritize their wellness, um, give them tools and resources, normalize these conversations. Um, I know it's like a long answer, but also not being able to play the sport. 
I had like an identity crisis of like, where do I fit? What's next? Like Mm -hmm. my whole schedule was always planned for me. And now I'm in college, not playing. And I got big, gained weight, gained all these other things. So um, yeah, your nutrition, how you feel, how your mental health is, all of that stuff plays a role in like how you show up every day. So um, that's what I love like teaching people about now too. No, that's what it's all about. And I'm sure the players that you work with, you know, love what you provide for them because, you know, not uh, obviously most recently is getting, you know, more awareness around it. And I know we're going to dive into that, but I want to talk about, you know, Phoenix, Tucson, because it used to be everyone would go to Florida. Everyone would go to Florida for preseason. And now, you know, go to Tucson or go to Phoenix. Do you think soccer in Arizona is viable for MLS franchise i do because i i was blown away by the support we got in tucson i will never forget when we hosted uh the sounders and the portland timbers like their supporters groups flew out we had people driving in flying in it would we we sold out and it was our stadium only holds like 4,500 people but still it was it was a really cool atmosphere to see like the support is here. Um, I think the only challenge though is the weather because in the summer where a lot of (laughs) things are happening, unless there's a climate controlled roof, something playing in 110 degree weather, even in June, July in the evening, it's still like 90 degrees. So that's the only downside, but the fan base is here working with Phoenix Rising people showed up and love it. So it's a yes and no question. Yeah. Yes okay. and no answer. <laughs> Perfect. No, I'm always interested because, uh, you know, especially, unfortunately, Sacramento is out of the contention for now. And, you know, a lot of people were talking about Phoenix being an option. Uh, so I just wanted to ask someone that's from there, that's worked with both uh, clubs, SC Tucson and Phoenix Rising, uh, your insight. Um, but let's get back to the important stuff. Uh, you know, no, being, one, uh, one more important question. Um, yeah. I mentioned you're from the Bay Area. What city? <laughs> yeah, so I was born in Hayward, raised in Union City. So people don't know what oh, you, where wow. Union City is. So yeah, I always. I'm, say it's I'm from the Bay too, so I was. I, I gotta ask. Yeah, I was born in Hayward too. So, but I moved to Sacramento when I was three. So when you said that, I was like, we must have been at the same Nigerian parties growing up somehow. Probably. 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 What high school did you go to? I went to Bishop Bay. O'Dowd. Okay, I went to James Logan High School. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Our yeah. our track teams would would square up sometimes. So <laughs> for sure, oh, the connection. Yeah, I had the nice crazy. track. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Right, sorry, I didn't want to derail it. I had to had to ask that though. No, nah, it's it's no it's North Carolina. That's what it's all about. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Uh, but yeah, let's get into you know your work as a nutrition and wellness coach because you know a lot of young guys they come to me and it's when it comes to nutrition, um, I'm all about you know like. My philosophy is if you can't catch it, kill it, grow it, you shouldn't eat it. Um, that's kind of how, how I go about it. But obviously, you're more of an expert in this space. So talk about the process from, you know, taking a client and kind of the whole phase to how you help them. Yeah. So typically, whenever somebody reaches out to me wanting um, guidance on nutrition, I like to see where they're, what they eat already. <laughs> There's a lot of... Uh, people are afraid of judgment. So I'm like, okay, what have you eaten over the past week? They're like, uh, here's my, my, my journal. I'm like, you had tofu and brown rice, broccoli and chicken. Okay. So what do you need my help for? It's, it's kind of just like, <laughs> don't be ashamed here. Like what yeah. do you actually eat? So I just have them track their food for like the first two weeks without trying to alter anything because a lot of times Either people are eating, they're not eating enough. That's the case that I find with a lot of athletes or they're eating too much of maybe like a protein and they're coming to me like, hey, I always have, um, I I get bloated after I eat certain foods all the time. So then they just choose to like not eat before a match. And it's kind of like, okay, let's see what you're eating, seeing how your body responds to certain things. Because a lot of times is that people are just in autopilot of just eating whatever's available they're rushing to their next meeting or rushing to the next training session. They, their schedules are so regimented. It's hard to even think about how your body responds to the food. So a lot of it is 
tracking what you're eating first and then measuring or just writing down how does your body feel after you eat certain foods and then we make adjustments as to okay you're low energy here this is what you should be eating let's try this and also an important part is the cultural element of food so going to school i was taught that healthy food is very eurocentric and it had to be broccoli and chicken and brown rice and i'm just like nigerians oh we eat lots of rice white rice <laughs> we we eat our meat but but I was told our food was unhealthy. And it's just like, just because we don't eat, the black community may not eat like, you know, uh, kale, but collard greens have just as much calcium and nutrients that are in kale, but kale is like the hailed food. So it's also telling people that like, hey, your food that you probably grew up eating is still healthy. So you still feel some level of enjoyment and pleasure and around eating your cultural foods, but um, making sure that you're eating the right foods for um, the energy you use throughout the day. I love that. Um, specifically, you know, you saying about the African food, I think it's really important that people understand that. You see a lot of athletes, you know, they get injuries. And I was like, if they're on the African diet, they want to have that, you know, they want to have that problem. But exactly. I, I want to talk about, you know, with FC Tucson, when you were first working with those players or the, you know, players at the lower level where the teams aren't providing meals and th different things like that. How can you eat healthy on a, a, a low budget? Yeah. Yeah. So people shame canned foods and frozen foods. There can be just as much nutrients in those kinds of foods and they last longer and uh, they're cheaper. So I had one, um, I'll just, there was one athlete that I worked with uh, last week and he was saying, he's a, a youth athlete. So he's only 16 and he was just like, my family eats mac and cheese a lot. So how can I, you know, I don't, how can I make this healthier? So it's like, okay, well, let's get some canned, you know, tomatoes or spinach. We tried to work and find out what are vegetables that you can add to just about any meal. I suggest that for all of my clients that don't really alter the taste of the food, but can add some nutrients to it. So for me personally, that's spinach and tomatoes. So for him, he added peas and tomatoes. I know it doesn't sound, or maybe if you imagine it, it doesn't look as appealing, but it's a simple way to add more nutrients to your food and not removing him from the family dinner dynamic. So um, a lot of the athletes there was just teaching them how to make um, like even just egg scramble. You can throw in a bunch of veggies in that, stir fries, um, just buying things in bulk that are frozen and canned can really save you a lot of time because now you're just adding things to your meals versus like removing stuff or trying to be super specific with your meals. Okay, I see. All right, so preseason pre just started for me. So if I'm um, coming to you for some help, I need like, well, I need a whole list. I like to eat a lot. Uh, so what are some foods that if I wanted to lose like a couple pounds so I can get faster on the field, then what are some foods that if I need to bulk up because, you know, I'm getting bodied up. This is all hypothetical. This is not happening. Um, I'm really getting then, bodied out there. <laughs> and then, <laughs> you know, I got jokes. And then what about like some like top five snacks, you know, outside of like, oh, you need a banana after before and after training um, that we can use. Sorry, that's like a, a long nah. question, but that's what we're here for. Okay, so to bulk up, I would focus more on just getting more calories in. So I would suggest the stir, kind of like Chipotle bowls. You can make your own version of a Chipotle bowl at home. Um, things that you can add to your meals to, to beef it up is like quinoa, rice, tofu that don't necessarily alter the taste of the food. Um, but also you don't want to, you want to give yourself enough time to process that food. So a lot of times if you are maybe eating Chipotle three times a day, it takes close to three hours to really break down all of that food. So I even bring up what kind of proteins are you consuming? On average for beef, it takes your body about three, three and a half hours to digest that beef. If it's chicken or turkey, maybe two hours. If it's a dairy type of protein, it's gonna take you roughly like an hour. So if you're gonna go on the pitch in less than an hour, I wouldn't suggest a Chipotle bowl, but looking at types of foods that you can just beef up your meals with, if you're looking to lose weight, um, I would, 
ask about, okay, how often are you training? Um, how many calories on average do we think you're burning? I don't know if you weigh yourself before training and after training to measure how much sweat you're losing. Um, Cause a lot of times too, you may just be eating foods that are making your body hold on to water weight or hold on to sodium. And maybe you don't need to lose the weight necessarily, but um, I would ask those questions first. And then it would maybe just come back to eating more lean proteins, like the turkey, lean cuts of beef, eating fish, using eggs, um, adding up lots of vegetables, which is what everybody should be having in general. But um, a lot of times too, with athletes that need to lose weight, it's more of just, okay, are you, how many calories are you actually burning and how much are you actually eating? I had a question. Um, you mentioned about like high sodium and stuff like that. What are your thoughts on like apple cider, apple cider vinegar, and then also like the gummies that are going around the apple cider vinegar gummies that are going around. Cause I'll take those. You know what? So, <laughs> are they doing anything? There, so I'm not going to lie. Like I, I was on the apple cider vinegar train. I was on my Instagram, like, Oh, I'm about to take my apple cider vinegar. <laughs> like, look at me. And when you start to do more research on it, it's not really doing anything. First off, apple cider vinegar is super acidic. It's great if you want to make like a salad dressing um, or if you used to cook with it, but taking it as a shot, it's not necessarily boosting your metabolism and burning fat. And because a lot of people are just taking it straight, they're not watering it down. It actually is uh, this, the acidity of the apple cider vinegar is higher than the pH in your stomach. So it can actually cause mm. some issues with your gut. So um, it's not really doing much. If somebody is like, hey, it's making me burn all this fat and do all this stuff, then kudos to you. I'm not going to judge you for that. But I also don't want to say like, I don't advise for people to start taking that if they're trying to lose that. If you're trying to lose fat, it goes back to burning calories, building muscle, eating lean cuts of um, eating lean types of proteins and vegetables. And yeah, apple cider vinegar is not the magic pill. Same thing with the gummies. And I like to preach food first versus supplements. So it's, yeah, they're not doing anything for you. Nah, thank you so much. I remember yeah, I bought two out. apple cider vinegars. They ain't been opened. I was like, <laughs> why am I following this trend? I don't, you know, yeah. this is nice. But okay, how about, you know, you talked about, you mentioned like, you know, different proteins and different things like that. A lot of athletes are going vegan and, you know, doing alternative meats like Beyond Meat and Impossible uh, Foods. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that in the sense of, uh, how can I say, um, how would you recommend if I'm never going to go vegan? That's sorry. Yeah. I can't do it. But a lot of athletes are. What are the benefits, pros and cons, different things like that? Yeah. So um, with, with Impossible Meat, I know with I've tried it, I enjoy it. I would also just be mindful of the ingredients in the food that the foods that are vegan, because if they are mimicking something, they're putting something in there to make it taste like what it's supposed to taste like. So with Impossible Burger, there is a lot of sodium in there. Um, and typically Americans have too much sodium and too much protein in general. So I would just take a look at the uh, sodium content, make sure you're hydrated. Um, if you are going vegan and you feel better and you feel like you're performing great, then that's fine. You can be a powerful, functional athlete being vegan. Um, it's, it's just, you just have to listen to your body and just be mindful of how it's responding after training. How do you feel when you wake up? Sometimes it's just a mind game of like the placebo effect of like, oh, if I cut this out, then I'm magically going to like, you know, feel better and perform better. And, and sometimes that's what it takes for the athlete to perform, but it's making sure that you are tracking how much protein you're getting in, What's your carb to fat ratio? What are the ingredients that you're taking in? Because sometimes vegan food is just as unhealthy because it's pumped with ingredients to mimic what they want it to taste like. Okay. You mentioned waking up. Um, sometimes I wake up and I'm like, I feel like a 70 year old man. Like I feel <laughs> I'm aching, my body's aching, my neck is cr crooked. So what are some things I can do either before bed mm -hmm. or after I wake up to kind of help alleviate that or prevent that in the future? Yeah. So I, 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 I like geek out about routines, like morning routines, evening routines, because I always say your morning starts the night before. So what are you That's doing the night before? 
that is setting you up for the morning. So if that means like how often or how long are you on your phone before you actually lay down and go to bed? Um, are you preparing your body for bed or are you just like falling asleep on the couch? All of those things are like physical and mental signs to tell your body like, hey, I appreciate you. I'm preparing myself for bed. So maybe it's drinking some water, drinking some hot tea, putting your phone away, charging it in another room, um, doing whatever routine you need to do to prepare yourself for bed. And then when you do wake up, I suggest the first 30 minutes, you're not looking at your phone. I would put um, a glass of water on my nightstand. So when I wake up, that's the first thing I take. It's flushing out all those toxins that have been building up in your mouth and your your throat, everything, flushing it down. Um, room temperature or hot water is best. And just creating some moments of stillness, quiet time, not rushing into the next. So if you are waking up feeling like, okay, crap, I have to be on point in like 30 minutes, maybe you need to wake up earlier or go to bed earlier. You should have some kind of quiet time, something to charge your body up to. If you're not a morning person, then it may take you a little bit longer to like get up. Sorry. Would you say you're a morning person or? Uh, I'm more of a, I'm more of a morning person than I am a night person. Um, mm -hmm. I've tried to, you know, start going to bed earlier and then, you know, waking up a little earlier. Um, I've tried the water thing, but every time I drink water, like it just activates my stomach and I just get like starving after that. So Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if that's if that's an effect of you know just me needing to eat right after that or soon after that or something. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, I'm more of a I would say I'm more of a morning person than an evening person. Okay, so maybe it's it's yeah having your morning routine of something that you can look forward to. But my morning routine is I wake up, I drink my water, I do my prayer and meditation, I do ten minutes of movement, and while I do my meditation, I am stretching out my neck. I do like some mobility rotations you have to wake your body up and recharge your body. It's been in this stiff, tense state for eight, nine hours. So you do have to do a little bit of work to, to pop it, pop, lock and drop it, you know, <laughs> do, do, and then, um, yeah, just wake your body up. But I would say spend some time intentionally trying to wake your body up. Now, I love what you said about, you know, routines. And you talked about it earlier about, you know, when you had to transition out of playing sports, you know, the, the sense of identity, not having your schedule planned. And, you know, the work that you do with athletes, you know, whether they're trying to make it to the next level, unfortunately, they don't, or they're going through a tough time. How, how can routines help with um, that, that rhythm? Um, that, yeah. That whole thing? Yeah, I, I think... Well, as I feel like as, as athletes, we're, we're used to routine and structure, but mm -hmm. when we have to create that own structure for ourselves, we're like, Ugh, like <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> so yeah. routine can force you to show up knowing that a routine is almost like a, it makes you feel comfortable knowing that like, hey, if I don't have a, a, a great day, I can trust that my morning routine will get me back on track the next day. So routines almost break that autopilot because it it makes your body feel comfortable knowing that like I'm doing this because I, I love my body I care for my body I know this is good for my body um, so routine routines are, are important but it has to be something that you do consistently it's not a one-off like I'm gonna do this for a week and my life is gonna change like there's no end point to mastering a routine it's maybe just like was it um habit stacking. So if you feel like you are waking up three minutes earlier and you feel great, but you now want to maximize your morning a little bit more, maybe it's waking up an hour early. If you're doing a 30 minute workout and you feel like that works for you, it's, it's finding those ways to kind of, yeah, build off of those habits that you already felt successful on. So, um, yeah, that's kind of a long answer, but. <laughs> no, I love that you brought up habit stacking. Cause that's something I've like recently implemented. I'm all about like productivity and being efficient, you know, like L I have a couple, you know, things on my plate. So trying to make sure I'm efficient as possible. Uh, but I want to bring it back to, you know, cooking uh, and wellness and nutrition. So what if this is not me? Cause I can cook, but for an athlete, young guy living on their own, small chaps, can't, yeah. can't really cook. What, like, how, how's it going to work? I can't go to Chipotle every day, you know? 
So I feel like egg scramble something is like the easiest, quickest thing to make because it's hard to burn eggs. And even if you do burn your eggs, you can still eat it. Like it's yeah. not like ruined. So eggs and loading it up with vegetables, you can add more protein to it by adding tofu or chicken or potatoes. If you want to make it heartier, you can make it into a burrito. You can um, have it on top of rice or quinoa. Like I feel like eggs with the protein and the vegetables are a meal itself. And it's just an easy thing that you can um, add to a bunch of stuff. Um, and I feel like Trader Joe's stir fries, <laughs> looking at stuff like that, that might be easier for you to, okay, if you're responsible for making the vegetables or the chicken or the protein piece, and then having half of it prepared in some other way. But um, I would say eggs are like the first thing that I tell people to make. And if they're a vegan athlete, then you can do the tofu and adding quinoa. Quinoa is a complete protein. Um, if you add beans and rice together, that makes a complete protein. So it's a, there's a lot of different alternatives, but I would start with the eggs because eggs are cheap too. You can get like 18 of them for like $2, um, get some vegetable stir fry. Like, yeah, it's, it's quick and easy. No, I love that. You know, cause I know some athletes that don't even know how to boil water. So if you're listening, yeah. <laughs> make sure you take note and, uh, you know, do what you need to do. There's YouTube, there's directions, you get a rice yeah. cooker, a little air fryer, crock pot, all these different mechanisms. So it's important tap to tap in with Chioma, man. Yeah, yeah, tap in for sure. Get that, that plan together. Experiment. experiment in the kitchen. Like not everything's going to be perfect. So don't give up if your first meal is, is a hot mess. But the more you like cook in the kitchen, the, like you, you know exactly the ingredients that are going in your body. Every time you eat out and eat at a restaurant, you're putting your health in the hands of somebody else. You can say like, yeah. hey, I would like wine cooked in olive oil. And they're going to be like, okay. To, <laughs> you can make a difference. Like, yeah. So it's like the more you can cook at home, I feel like your body also responds in a more positive way to it because um, it's kind of a, a tangent, but I would say right now we're so far removed with how our food gets to our plate that the pleasure that comes in cooking the food, you know, even sharing the food, it all of that is gone. So when you are cooking your food, it does give your body a sense of like fulfillment and joy and you know the ingredients that are going into your body. So I always encourage people to find at least one or two meals, even the kids I work with. I'm like, you know how to cook some eggs. Your parents <laughs> are going to be with you all the time or you can make a quesadilla, you can make some mac and cheese and throw some vegetables in there like yeah yeah i, I tell you you can make something you can make something so i got one question for you because you're nigerian like myself and growing up my mom she never used measuring cups so when you cook do you use like measuring cups and all that you just i don't use measuring cups unless i'm baking because baking is a science there's an art to baking okay. But when I cook stews and, and people on Instagram are like, what's your recipe? I'm like, ooh. <laughs> um, I feel uh, you because my friends will do the same thing. I'm like, bro, I don't know. I just put a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Yeah. It feels right. <laughs> yeah. You cook with your heart and it just, it just, it just, yeah, it just comes out of you. But I, I am trying to be more intentional with writing things down and measuring things because ultimately I'd like to make like a cultural cookbook of some sort that gives uh where people can see their culture their culture represented in healthy foods right I now like I, it's so eurocentric so if we can yeah just tell people like hey your food is just as healthy as you know some of this baked chicken and broccoli yeah. <laughs> no, i feel you on that for my fellow you know, africans if you're eating fufu you know, sometimes not every day pound of yam. You can do pounded wheat. You can do pounded plantain. You can do different things like that. So you know, I I, I mix. I don't know if, if people get upset with me, but I mix oatmeal a little oh, bit yeah. with my, my fufu. Yes, yeah, so you just call it o fufu, and you get, <laughs> and it's still you get the fiber. It still tastes fine if the stew is is a good stew. It's you won't really taste the difference. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You mentioned tracking, being able to track where your food is coming from. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on like these meal prep services, like Freshly and stuff like that, where they claim to like provide fresh and, you know, 
healthy meals for people who are like too busy to cook and stuff like that. What what are your thoughts on those? I think it's it's a it's a good it's a good idea because everything's measured out. I don't I, it like reduces food waste. Um, it comes with very specific instructions on how to prepare your food. I always think that wherever you live, go to a farmer's market, try to, you know, go to the local markets. That's because I also think supporting local is a huge part of, you know, knowing where your food is coming from. So not to knock them, I think it's a great idea if you live in like an urban area, like a city where you don't maybe have access to some of those things, and that can be a good option. But I always uh, recommend for people whenever you move to a new city, like find your farmer's markets, find those local mom and pop shops, because that's where, you know, you can really yeah, learn about the different cultures there. Like, oh, how long have you guys been here? Here in Kansas City, we have City Market, which is awesome. And um, yeah, so hope that answered your question. <laughs> yeah. No, that's big time. And uh, before we change gears, you know, I just want to make a note, like, you know, as an athlete, you're basically a, a nice car. You don't put bad gas in a nice car. So your nutrition is a very important, you know, what you do. So you make sure you come and check out Chioma and all the wonderful things that we uh, that she's doing. Um, but with that being said, you mentioned Kansas City. Um, talk about your work with them. You know, you had a big stage. I had the chance to play for Sporting Kansas City, one of the premier clubs from MLS in terms of doing it the right way and everything that they're doing. So uh, please share y- your work with them. Yeah. So I originally, when I moved to Kansas City, I worked in the youth soccer department, and then I'm currently now in the community programs department. So on Monday, which was really exciting, is that we announced our kits that have our nonprofit on the front, which is the Victory Project. So that is the uh, not our in-house nonprofit uh, for sporting, and we also expanded our mission. Um, before we primarily focused on kids battling cancer, and now we've expanded our mission to include um, soccer for all kids, which is giving more kids access to the game and kids with disabilities. So um, we have an existing partnership with Special Olympics and we've done um, a lot of stuff there, but it's been awesome to, to kind of see the evolution of expanding our mission getting all this buy-in and we've got such positive press from it. I was actually like blown away. What happened on, um, was it Friday last week? Cause we started to hint at our Jersey that was going to be released on Monday. And one of the kids that we had, um, that had come out for a match day on a reef, he had his last round of radiation. So I kept in touch with his mom, saw that she posted, um, some pictures. So he got to ring the bell and, um, I was like, hey, can I post this on social? Posted it on social and it just like retweeted like wildfire. One person asked like, hey, can I tweet out the link to your do- to like your, your donate link? And then she tweeted it out. Another person started to donate. We collected like a lot of donations just from that like Twitter storm. So um, it, it's, it's been really cool to just be on the other side of now helping um, the community engage with us in a way that soccer really hasn't um, touched people in Kansas City. So I believe soccer is an amazing platform that speaks the world's language. And it's just been fun to create new programs and um, just try to see, like, yeah, what we can do. No, that's what it's all about. And uh, I just want to make a point. Victory Project KC has the best annual uh, banquet uh, from any soccer team and they do a great job with that but when it comes to uh, community initiatives I know you mentioned some new ones if you're allowed to share what are some specific ones that you're excited about specifically ones you know as you guys mentioned soccer for all um, you know with kids with disabilities or you know kids in the black community yeah, so um, I'll start with kids with disabilities. We have a we have a partnership of Variety KC and then uh, Special Olympics. You know, our unified teams will play against MLS clubs, um, and we'll have that rivalry going on. Obviously, with COVID last year, we weren't able to travel, but um, it's just giving kids an opportunity to be outside. I think a lot of times people feel like if you use a soccer platform, you have to be like really, really good at soccer and you have to love the game. And I think soccer is a way to teach kids life skills, like how to be on a team, how to communicate, how to problem solve, how to um, 
try something, suck at it, and then try again. So there's all these different ways that soccer can, um, yeah, can touch people. So with uh, with our kids with disabilities, it's just providing a game or just a field opportunity for these kids to come out. And there's uh, power wheelchairs with larger soccer balls and wheelchairs that have uh, kind of like a, a net at the bottom or a cage at the bottom that allows the kids to, to use that and be on the field and be outside and have other kids running alongside them. Um, another initiative we have with Sporting United is um, it's a group of kids from uh, two primarily Hispanic um, uh, soccer clubs, and it's giving them an opportunity to compete against some of our academy affiliates, which is, you know, it's that pay to play model that um, we talk about a lot. And just that's just the barrier in a lot of things. So we're just trying to find strategic ways to eliminate that barrier. And like I said, it doesn't mean that every kid is going to be on a soccer team, but maybe it's okay, you get to come to a clinic, we're providing you with equipment, we're providing scholarships for you to attend a camp. We are um, also providing mentorship opportunities where even though I didn't play professionally, soccer still provided a, pro a professional pathway for me. So if you're interested in communications, marketing, like we need all of that in a soccer club. And just showing girls too, it's like, if I work for a men's team, so that, you know, being a woman working in the sports industry, there's not a lot of women to begin with and not a lot of black women to begin with. So I think visibility and just showing almost being a little um, bold with my presence and being out front sometimes um, is needed just so kids can see that like, hey, this person that looks like me is doing doing some stuff with a with the soccer team. No, that's amazing. And can you talk about that? You know, obviously, um, we want to honor you. It's, you know, Women's <laughs> History Month uh, last month, but we celebrate the whole year. It's uh, Black History Month, Black History Year. Uh, for anyone that's looking to get into the sports space, uh, specifically soccer, uh, what are some actionable advice that you, you know, would give them or recommendations from that standpoint? Yeah, I I would say like networking is is huge and almost like I felt like I held every position <laughs> in soccer, but I think it was just as important to realize what I didn't like and finding out like, okay, this is what fits. This is what feels good. So trying new things and putting yourself out there. Um, every preseason, I would make sure to visit one MLS club that I might have had interest in possibly working with. So I went to Seattle. I would make sure it was all, they played a, a team that was also at preseason. So I would maximize my networking efforts. Like, okay, Seattle met up with them. Oh, they're playing Colorado. I know the coaches and the staff there. Okay, they're playing I would go to LA when they played uh, Houston because they were both in um, preseason. So it's networking, being bold, letting people know what you want to do, um, always being a student. But it's just if you can volunteer or just be in, spend your money a little bit to be in those spaces to show that you're invested. Um, I think that's when they're just like, okay, this person is serious. They want to stick around, even if it's just for a week or two. Um, just be bold and ask those questions. I just want to kind of uh, get into those doors. Like you mentioned, mm -hmm. going to work for these teams, but how, how do you, what's the first step? How do you reach out to them? How do you contact them? How do you get that opportunity in the first place? Yeah, I would say it depends on the field you want to go into. Um, I would say for me, because I was volunteering as an intern, like, let's say like I interned for like two years before I actually was like, okay, I think this is something I, I want to stick around and do. But um, I was just annoying in a sense of, hey, I, I dropped out of school at one point because I didn't know what I wanted to study. I, I was nursing, then I switched to pre-physiology, then I'm like, okay, I'm wasting all this money. Let me just take some time off and figure out what I want to do. And when I went back to school to study nutritional sciences, I asked the, um, the owners of FC Tucson, like, hey, I want to be in the fitness nutrition space. Can you guys help me get there? They're like, okay, well, we have a fitness coach who will be coming here in April. And I was like, okay, well, can I be his assistant? They gave him my information, but I also had a track record of, you know, working hard, showing up on time, um, being consistent and just willing to do anything I could to just help. Um, and 
that opened up a door where I was became the assistant fitness coach. He moved on to Seattle. I became the head fitness coach. The director of ops moved. I became the director of operations and I stuck around. But I know not everybody has um, like that environment to be in. So I would say to niche down on what specifically you want to work in and see if you can like, is there a conference that some of those people that are working in the department you want to work with are going to that you can kind of, you know, hey, this is what I'm interested in doing. That FaceTime is so important because I think emails and resumes and teamworks online, like all of that stuff is so, um, I feel like people don't really pay too much attention to that. So it's mm -hmm. getting that FaceTime and finding those, those, yeah, where, where are those people? I, you kind of have to be a little stalkerish, but you have to get that FaceTime. And I really like how you say you kind of got to ask for what you want and not just ask, but, you know, get up and serve your own plate to a, to a certain point. So um, that's great advice. You know, being a black woman in sports, can you talk about some of the highlights and you know, maybe some of the negatives for someone that, you know, takes your advice and then gets to that point, things that they need to look out for on that roadmap? Yeah. So I would say it's like a, when you're the only black person in a room, sometimes, sometimes you don't even like you, you realize it, but then sometimes it's like, right when you're about to speak, you realize you're the only black person. So you kind of like, how are they going to receive this? Okay. Am I speaking out of passion right now? Okay. What is the point that I want to make? Because I'm in this room for a reason, but also it's, I think that's the, the hard part is that there's always this like analysis of like, okay, when do I speak up? When, when do I actually fight for something? Okay. Did I have a meeting before the meeting? Sometimes I do that. And I'm like, Hey, I'm going to pitch this idea. Do you think this is a good idea? If you, if you do think it's a good idea, I'd appreciate it if you backed me up. So I feel like there's all these, all this planning that has to happen in order for, um, my voice sometimes to be taken seriously but i would say that you have to really like just get to know people and build that social credibility throughout the office like i have a when i first uh, started working at sporting my goal was to make sure that any meeting that was happening someone in the room could speak about me in a positive way so i intentionally would you know ask people out for coffee, you know, try to remember certain things about people. I took uh, notes on, okay, this person has this many kids. Okay, this person is from here, this person. And it's like, should I have to do that to, you know, climb the social ladder? But I think it's a part of just people skills and a way of relating to people, a way of, you know, people feeling comfortable having those, you know, conversations with you that may put you know somebody that you know in a position of hey this we're going to open up this job do you know anybody actually I do like let me because you know me and you know my work ethic you will trust my word so it's a lot of it's a lot of it's exhausting sometimes but I will say that I do have a lot of supportive people in the office and I've learned a lot and sporting has been a great way for me to just like cultivate just corporate, uh, corporate skills. Working in Arizona was more on the technical side and we were a startup. So a lot of it was just, you know, doing things differently every day versus uh, here where there's systems and there's processes in place. And there's people who are experts in certain fields that you can utilize like, hey, okay, I need help with this copy for this new foundation we're going to launch. Like, help me, like, people, there's, there's people that want you to win. So it's just a matter of, yeah, just showing that, Hey, I, I'm, we're all on the same team here. Uh, that's what it's all about. Um, it, you brought up a point about, you know, should you have to do all that? And that's, that's kind of what, you know, everything that's going on recently, that's what we kind of, it's, it's, it's hard to see, but obviously, you know, your hard work has definitely led you to where you are. And, um, you know, we wish you the best of luck as you continue to climb up the ladder. So please remember me when I when I'm shooting over my resume and may need something new. Of course. <laughs> All right. And then I wanted to ask because obviously Kansas City and U.S. Soccer they made that partnership with the big national center. Um, how hands on are they with some of the stuff that you guys are doing in the community 
Um, obviously, you guys use their facility and uh, different things like that. Yeah, so I would say I've, I've been in my role now since May 2020. So I we haven't had like a lot of overlap. Um, I would say like the U.S. Soccer Foundation with like the mini pitches that are happening. Um, that's probably been um, one of like the I guess the only conversations that have really happened. Um, but as far as US soccer, I would say um, our work is pretty separate um, in terms of community engagement. And the cool thing with the Victory Project is it's a foundation, but then we also have like Sporting Kansas City and our community relations. And um, it's almost like two separate pillars. So um, I feel like we, we stay busy <laughs> with all of our work. We have now, I believe 15 Academy affiliates. Uh, we just, uh, signed one in Oklahoma, one in Michigan. So that's close to like 50,000 youth soccer athletes where we're providing, you know, coaching education, we're providing them, you know, these really cool kits and logos and all this other stuff. And we have a rec league here that we do a lot of stuff with our, with our clinics. Um, so I feel like we, we have a lot going on already, but um, there hasn't been too much overlap just yet. Okay. That's really interesting. Thank you for sharing. And I, I do know the uh, the expansion of the affiliates is also a scouting tool. Uh, Kansas City does a great job with their scouting network, uh, probably one of the best in the league. Uh, you mentioned top five teams, you know, when you before you got to your position. Obviously, Sporting Kansas City is number one. But what are the other uh, four? I don't know if I want to say it. <laughs> fair, fair enough. I thought I was going to try to get you on that. Uh, yeah, all right. I, I really do. I, I would say a lot of the clubs have been um, – whenever I would go visit, they've always treated me very well and they've taken good care of me. So I, I have love for almost every team that has, that has come to Arizona, but okay. sporting definitely stuck out as like, okay, this is, this is where I want to be. Uh, okay. I love that. <laughs> um, top five cheat meals. You know, we talk about eating healthy, but you know, every now and then you gotta, you know, get that weekend in and out. I'm a Cali boy. I do that. Yeah. So, you know what? what? So, so I like to say now, um, I, I recently just said, I don't use the word cheat meal anymore. Okay. I would like for us to look at food as, okay, what, what are my needs today? Eat what I need to eat for my needs today. If I know that I am stressed or I just kicked, mm, can I curse on here? Why don't, is, is ass the curse awesome. word? <laughs> if I, I kick ass right. in a meeting, anything so it's I know like ice cream and cookies for me is like my thing but I don't I don't like to beat myself up as to like crap like okay let me pig out now and eat all of this because I'm not going to have a cheat meal for like another week or two so I just like to challenge people to look at your meals it's like okay what are my needs today what do I need to get through if you have a lot if you're stressed and you know you need to eat that ice cream to get through your day by all means eat the ice cream so for me in and out, you already said it. Um, uh, ice cream and cookies, a pazuki. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful dessert. Um, uh, jollof rice. I feel like if I didn't say that, jollof rice. No, that's is, not even a cheat meal. That's a main. That's a good meal. You know, but like, I eat a lot of it. Oh, okay, so fair enough. Like, I can eat a lot more than what I should be eating. So. Jollof rice, pizza. I feel like I, I can always get down with some pizza. And uh, last one, I don't know, wine. I love wine. Maybe that is that it's not a meal, but like wine and some, uh, some chocolates, something. <laughs> no, a lot of athletes are really into wine lately. It's like a, almost like a relaxing type thing. Obviously, mm -hmm. you got the NBA guys, but I know a couple of MLS guys as well that, you know, really value just like wine with a nice meal. So I appreciate you sharing. And um, we're going to change the, the terminology. No more cheat meals. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what you got, L? Um, let's go ahead and move into two truths in the cap. Okay. okay. So hold on a second. All right. So this is a game we like to play here where our guest Chioma will give us three facts about herself. Two will be true, one will be a lie, and Amobi and I have to guess what the lie is. Okay. So, Amobi, you was doing good, kind of slipped up last week, but <laughs> you're on, you're on a good streak. So I'm on a good run. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
So whenever you're ready, go ahead. All right. So first one, I stepped on a toothpick and it sent me to the ER. Number two. Oh, wait, do you guys do it? And then, or do I just, yeah, just do, oh, yeah. do all three. Yeah. Second one, I was in an elevator with uh, David Beckham and Christina Milian and all of David Beckham's kids. Um, and I went hiking in Arizona and got lost for two hours and had to rescue me. Did you hike in Phoenix or Tucson? Phoenix. Phoenix. There's not even like crazy hikes like that. It's the Camelback. Um, all right, Beckham in the elevator. What's just what is Victoria there? Or was just like Bro, you rock- can't you can't stop asking questions. Stop asking questions. You can't ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay. That's toothpick. I mean, she threw Christina Milian in there. That's super ran- that's too that's random. That's so random. For, for like, like be a lie. Yeah. You know. How do you just think of like Christina Milian as a name? You know, that has to be the truth. I'm not sure. She says she has some injuries, but like a toothpick, walking barefoot, like between like games at the youth club. Yeah, toothpicks and yeah. That means it got like stuck in the. Uh... Nah, you're from Arizona. I'm going cap on the uh, again lost in the hike. Yeah, I'm gonna go cap on the hike too. <laughs> you guys are good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Good, sh- good stuff. Okay. <laughs> I was nice. like, because in, in Phoenix, that only got Camelback uh, uh, Mountain, right? What other hikes are there? Okay. Are we back? Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. So in Phoenix, well, other hikes. like that one hike. Yeah, I'm surprised you guys want you guys got that right, but kudos to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Yeah, we're kind of getting good at this game. All right, so let's jump into um, our topic for the for the week: um, U.S. soccer being in shambles. Now, we'll preface this with Chioma. We don't want to get you in trouble. We know <laughs> you work or may work adjacently with U.S. soccer, so you know don't get yourself in trouble. Definitely don't want to see you, you know, in any hot water or anything. But you know, there's this guy who shall remain nameless. Um, he was kicked off the U.S. Soccer uh, Athletes Council for going on a racially insensitive rant in response to the Federation's pro kneeling policy. So, you know, this person has been active online since then, um, uh, since his removal, and he's been doing things, doing everything except apologizing, essentially. And, you know, in the comments, we've noticed that there's been a few U.S. men's national team players kind of, you know, agreeing with him, showing support, all this other stuff. So my question to you guys is, and first, like, a Moby on you from your end from a player in and then chioma from like a mental health and wellness in like a moby like what type of environment does this create in the locker room you know clearly there's a line that's been drawn with some of these guys so when it comes to like the black players versus you know these other players what type of line is that draw in the locker room and how does that affect chemistry um in terms of you know playing the game yeah it's it's, it's tough obviously we're not going to get into the, the whole situation with what's going on on that standpoint um but with any team, there's always clicks, you know, when teams go out to eat, you know, friends or people that associate with themselves will tend to hang out. Usually that doesn't carry over onto the field. Like once the, everyone crosses the line, you know, we're on the same team. But when it comes to a situation like this, definitely in practice, you're going to see a little bit of uh, high intensity when it comes to, you know, certain situations um, because you can't really address it like you want to address it because mm-hmm. – they are your teammate. Um, But situations like that tend to arise more often than not when it comes to a situation like this. Um, It does, it definitely affects it because, you know, guys or gals that you thought you were, you're close with, you know, even though you're not teammates, you don't have to be best friends, but you have some level of respect and a friendship. uh, You get to see their true colors. So um, I know I'm going to go all out for my teammate that I I know that's going to have my back rather than, someone that will say they have my back, but then I turn around and they're in the group chats or they're in the comments or, you know, they, they saying something else that they don't really mean. So I don't think it'll affect it too much because those guys are mature enough. And some of the guys that commented are not really, well, actually not all of them, but some of them aren't involved with Mm -hmm. the men's national team. But as it translates, this is not just uh, a men's national team standpoint, you know, it affects the club as well. So uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm, I'm interested to see, how people move forward if it, if it plays a role 
um, too much at, or carries over to the field. Okay. And Chiyom, Chiyoma, from your end, um, so this, uh, this obviously affects the mental wellness of the players, the Black players, especially everything, I guess, over the last year that Black players have kind of had to to bear the weight of, especially the women's players. Um, what are some tips that you can give to kind of help them battle through the, I guess, mental strain of having to be the voice for your race, having to kind of put on this strong face, having to kind of be kind of like the the social, I guess, figurehead for something that the Federation may be trying to, you know, promote, you know, so, so do you get you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. It, it, Cause I, I've heard, I've heard lots of arguments with, you know, like, Oh, this black player is now just speaking up for like joining the movement. So like, I can't trust this black person because they're just now speaking up or something. I think just as a people, just we need to support people in any role that if they are the minority in on their team, their office, you, you don't know what they have to go through like outside of what the media is projecting out. So I think supporting those people and showing that support, whether that's verbal, sending them, I don't, we just need to support people a little bit more, but also knowing that you don't have to do all of this by yourself, that there are people that want to come alongside you to provide that support for you. And when you are in the bubble as an athlete, like, I feel like sometimes working in the sports industry, we're in our own little bubble. And when I worked in Arizona, MLS preseason was like a bubble of like, if you weren't on, if, if you weren't involved in MLS preseason, I wasn't talking to you. Like my friends knew that like the first th those three months, like I'm gonna talk to you guys in April. So it's like, you're almost, you almost forget that there's people out there that can support you. So it's seeking those resources, but also just not doing it all by yourself because it is mentally and emotionally exhausting. So whether that is seeking therapy, um, I believe prayer and therapy works. <laughs> uh, I think they're a powerful combination um, and just talking about it. And if you don't feel comfortable talking to your, your teammates about it, there's still a healing that comes from just verbally communicating how you feel. So it's, do you have someone that you can be like really vulnerable with that you know isn't going to judge you and, you know, take it out on you, like on, on the field. So um, yeah, seek out those resources, know that you don't have to do this by yourself, that there are people that want to come alongside and support you. And it's okay to, you know, if you don't feel like fighting today, it's, it, it's okay. Like I, that stress and that pressure, like every day I, when I like look at my, like my calendar of meetings, it's like, all right, what am I going to fight for today? Like what, what is my energy going to go to today? So just being mindful of that too, because our own mental and emotional health is, is, is important. If we're not well and we're tired, exhausted, angry, like nobody benefits from that. No, sure. I love what you said about, you know, picking your fights because, you know, as a you know, African-American or black athlete, you have to perform at a high level so you can keep your job. You have to, you know, speak out for what you think is wrong, but then you also have to explain it to others, you know, why things may look a certain way or why that's wrong. So it could get overwhelming. So you know, you're the student, you're the, you're the teacher, you're the activist, and also you're the player. So uh, for any athlete listening to this, you know, definitely take Shiomo's advice around, you know, finding help from others. You know, there's a community out there for you that's willing to share and willing to help, willing to be a resource. And, you know, not every day it's struggle, struggle, stress, stress, fight, fight. You know, you have to pick your battles accordingly. Yeah, 100%. Uh, thank you for those tips, definitely, because yeah. it, can, it can apply to more than just sports. Like, you know, being, you know, one or few only Black people in your company, you know, you kind of have to deal with that same thing. So definitely mm -hmm. appreciate those tips. Um, so let's move into another game we like to play on the show. Um, no card, yellow card, red card. So this is a rapid fire game that we play where I will read off some news topics and you will kind of give your thoughts or opinion on that topic based on using the soccer card system. So no card is, you know, I agree with it or I'm cool with that. Um, yellow card is I can go either way. 
and red card is I disagree or you know I'm not cool with it. Thumbs down, okay. right? All right. Um, and, and kind of give a little explanation as to why you know you gave that that rating. So, uh, first one, no card, yellow card, red card. Messi, Messi and Ronaldo are both out of Champions League quarters for the first time since 05. Will either of them win Champions League again? Yellow card. <laughs> yellow <laughs> card. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can give a yellow card on that. I, yeah, I, I, I don't really have any passionate feelings towards it or the other. I don't know. I would say that they would still win the championship they still have a lot of fight to they still have a lot of i feel like reasons to play so yeah fair enough yeah i'm going i'm going no card i think uh it's good to see new life you know every year it's the same thing we see ronaldo or messi uh so let's 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 see some new blood in there everyone's talking about mbappe and holland as the next next ronaldo and messi um, I do think Messi might get another one, depending on if he leaves or not. Cristiano, Juventus, Juventus, I don't know if they're cursed or what, but I don't see him getting another one. Maybe CONCACAF Champions League or something like that. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, he's probably headed out of Juventus this year anyway. Yeah, it's bad for that. Yeah, not Where do you going. think he goes next, though? Oh, he still wants to play at a high level. I think, I mean, back to England. You think he goes back to Man U to close it out? I think he could. I think he could, yeah. Uh, where else? I don't have a dog in that fight. I, yeah. I really don't care, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I think that's what my yellow card was. Like, I was just like, I feel like we've always been talking about them for like, yeah. since I've known them. So I'm just like, I don't really, whatever they do, like they will continue to do great things. But it's like, eh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good that's a good shout. Like, where does he go if he if he does leave? So, it should be interesting because they're not they're not even gonna win the league right now the way it's looking. So you're gonna yeah. go trophyless. Yeah, I can't think of anywhere else besides Man U that he would go. Like, yeah, who knows? <laughs> All right, next one. Um, no card, yellow card, red card. Arsenal, Arsenal, Adidas, and LA-based brand 424 collaborate for a lifestyle apparel brand. So I guess the rating would be on your your thoughts on this collaboration. I don't know if you've seen it or not, or seen what they recently rolled out. Um, but they have it's like a black and red kind of capsule collection. Um, I'm hoping we put that on there. I'm gonna put that on him. Oh uh, yeah, no worries. <laughs> I thought you was, I thought you would have seen it because you you're the Arsenal fan, but I've, I have seen it. Oh, uh, okay. I'm talking about Chiyomo, a lot though. of uh, <laughs> a lot of um, a lot of the European teams are doing a good job of incorporating American culture and mm -hmm. lifestyles to their like apparel and stuff like that. So just wanted to get your thoughts on um, what you thought about it. I know Sporting Kansas City worked with my guy. Shout out to Abun, fellow Nigerian as well, uh, LBF on a you know apparel style. Uh, brand collab so mm -hmm. hopefully we see more of that in mls but you know european teams are doing that uh, so just wanted to see you know no card yellow card red card on your thoughts i guess generally on the idea of it that's i like it i like it i think when we can i feel like black people we put a spin and just we just add more pizzazz and spice to things and i like that this is a way to kind of take soccer like off the pitch and like how you can make it a lifestyle and have conversations of, you know, it soccer is more than just what happens on the field. So I think that the more we can, yeah, just provide options for like, I think like even just black kids to interact with the sport in that way. I feel like right now it's football and basketball is what's visibly seen. So if we can use soccer to like, hey, you wear the brand, it's, it's connected to a rapper that they know. It's just um, expanding and just, yeah, just giving more people um, eyes on the game. So no card? No you card. Yeah. No card, yeah. Yeah, no card for me either. I love it. All right. All right, so last one. No card, yellow card, red card. Montreal hires from within. Wilfred Nancy, um, a black French coach. 
um, has worked within the academy since inception. So he's recently been promoted to the head head coach or manager role for the team. So thoughts on that? I love it. I did not see this coming, given that Thierry kind of, I guess, abruptly left. And I know it was for <laughs> family reasons. And But, it, you know, it's kind of like, uh, yeah. So <laughs> I would have thought that, you know, they would have replaced him with, you know, somebody who's had this longstanding MLS career. You know, like, I feel like MLS not recycles coaches, but, you know, coaches, yeah. they they play they they'll coach multiple teams so I, I i love this i think it's a replacing a black coach with another black coach is a statement um i just hope that he has the support and the the people around him to succeed and they're not putting putting him in a position where see this is why there's not a lot of black <laughs> so uh, they'd be trying to give people like us a short leash yeah i'm, I'm really rooting for him so yeah, no, I love it. Uh, hopefully he does well. And I definitely think, you know, he knows the club. He knows, you know, what it takes to succeed at the next level. So hopefully um, he does well. So we're rooting for him, you know, as a as a contingent. Oh, so sure. no card. Yeah, sorry. My no card. <laughs> All right. Cool. So that's it for uh, no card, yellow card, red card. But we're going to jump right into our black soccer history for this week. Um, so this week we'll be giving flowers to Eddie Pope. Uh, so George Edward Pope is a retired American soccer player who spent 11 years as a defender for the United States national team in 12, 12 of those years in Major League Soccer, mostly with DC United. He's also a member of the National Soccer Hall of Fame. So born in Greensboro, um, Greensboro, North Carolina, for those who are unfamiliar, Pope has a very successful career playing for the North, had a very su- successful career playing for the North Carolina Tar Heels, where he also kicked for Mac Brown's football team. So dual sport guy um so in 94 he was the first team all-american and also earned all acc and all south region honors in 96 dc united selected pope second overall in the first round of the mls college draft his first season in dc was split between united and the men's olympic team which was preparing for the 96 olympics in atlanta however he still managed to play 18 games for united and won a league title with the team scoring a golden goal in the first ever mls cup against the Los Angeles Galaxy. He also played his first game with the national team, helping the team beat Trinidad and Tobago 2-0 on November 10th of that year. Now, on June 14th, 2007, Pope announced his plans to retire from all competitive soccer at the end of the 2007 season. On March 11th, 2011, he was selected for induction into the National Soccer Hall of Fame. Post-career, Pope served as the Director of Player Relations for the MLS's player union following his retire following his playing retirement and also in 2015 he left the mls players union to work at the octagon sports agency so we want to salute eddie pope for being a fixture in american soccer um as always thank you yeah shout out to uh eddie pope he's done amazing things uh he's kind of sort of like a silent assassin was what he's done um especially specifically with the players union as uh, MLS has advanced, one of the OGs, now he's doing it from the agency side. So shout out to him. Uh, and I know we, we're towards the end of the show, but uh, Chima, I wanted to ask you, growing up, did you have any like people that you looked up to from the you know, U.S. soccer standpoint, both men's and women's, you know, from the Black perspective? And if you played club, how many people looked like you on your team? Ooh. All right, so... I was a huge fan of Brianna Scurry and Mia Hamm. Mm-hmm. I would say those were just the two that were like the most talked about. I feel like everybody knew Mia Hamm and then Brianna Scurry, just her being in the goal. Like, I just think that that was the only person I felt like I could look up to um, on uh, the U S women's national team. And when I played club, ugh. you know, so Elsa, she's from uh, she's from Eritrea, so we we had the African right, like, okay, West African, East African thing going, and uh, yeah, Michaela. So there were there were two black girls, and then there were two girls that were um, biracial. I still considered them black, so I would say there there was a handful of us, and I think living in the Bay Area, that was really what 
there was there was a lot of culture on our club high school that was a different story so i was literally like the only one in high school so <laughs> oh, that's really interesting thank you for sharing yeah. but yeah shout out to the og eddie pope and yeah it's crazy growing up you know seeing seeing them how about you were you like how was your uh, playing when you were younger club soccer there's three to four max and um my, my fellow nigerian you know how everyone's a cousin uh yeah. we're basically cousins one of my best friends adi um and then one of my other best friends cameron might uh, so shout out to those guys and then even before that jamil hall raho tebo kebulan um those are some other guys but besides that that's kind of it and if i'm forgetting yeah. anyone sorry those are like the five that stand out of course across my club soccer career yeah i'm sure i forgot someone so yeah <laughs> There's not a lot of us. No. But um, that's it for the show. Chioma, thank you so much. Where can people find you? You know, if they want to eat right, if they want to live right, if they want to get the mentors. Yeah. Uh, what uh, what fellow NorCal Bay Area, Marshawn Lynch say? Protect your uh, protect your mentals? They protect your chicken and, and your mentals. <laughs> yeah. Protect so how can this happen with you? <laughs> yeah, get, get, your chicken, your chicken oh. and your mentals. Yeah. Uh, got it okay okay i see okay i like that okay uh instagram is where people can find me it's just chioma.atanmo so just my first name dot my last name or you can find me at mindfulappetite.com um and it's the same uh social media handles on twitter and you can also find me on uh mindful appetite on facebook so yeah perfect and you mentioned you're coming out with the cultural cookbook soon when, when can we expect that L always a supporter. He probably pre-ordered it already, but I'm trying to see where it's at. You know what? I would say it, it's recipes are very, it takes a lot longer than you, I would think that you can just, you know, throw some stuff together. There's like a whole formula to it and you have to replicate the recipes, have other people replicate the recipes before it's called a recipe. So maybe in a year, in a year, you might you, you'll see it. Yeah. So we already got you locked in. A year from now, we're going to do the update episode. We'll probably keep in touch before then. Um, but make sure you guys check her out. Oh, what you got? I mean, that's pretty much it. Oh, um, shout out to the homies. Shirtlift Plantain Show. They just dropped their merch. The merch pack just came in. So we're wearing the Unserious shirt. Um, right. You'll probably see a lot more of that. Uh, I don't have any two cents stuff on today, unfortunately. But typically have a two cents hat or something on. Always got a rep for the brand. But I always want to also want to support the other black soccer brands and media brands that are out there as well. So shout out to them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, respect. Make sure you guys check them out. Uh, we had him on a, a previous podcast or show as well. So that's what it's all about. But thanks again, Chioma. It's a pleasure to you know finally meet you. We've been and thank you for you know adjusting your schedule to make it work. That's thank our show. you. Guys. I also just want to say thank you for having me on here. And I love what you guys are doing, just spotlighting Black people in the game. It's like we're out here. So I appreciate you guys using your platform. Yep. To just give, yeah, just tell people like, hey, this game is for you. You don't have to be, you know, you can work in the front office. You can work. I saw you guys had Drake Hill on here. You had Nicole Hercules on here from Black Soccer Coaches. So like, yeah, this, this game is for you and we're out here. So I appreciate what you guys are doing. Show, yo, we got to get Nicole on. We haven't had her on yet, but we got to oh, get her on. Okay. So, okay, you just spoke Thank it into you. existence. Yeah, I yeah did. spoke it into yeah. existence. There next. you go. Yeah. He's next. <laughs> so, all definitely right. follow us on the socials at Two Cents FC across all socials. Um, check out our merch shop, Two Cents, Two Cents Sports Shop. Um, that helps support the show, helps us, you know, maintain these server bills and whatnot. <laughs> um, and also tweet us your comments, let us know what you think of the show, any questions you have for our guests hit us up we are very responsive so till then till next week peace